All right. Good morning, Freedom Church. You feeling good this morning? Keep those hands clapping for all those watching online. Would you just welcome them this morning, our online family joining us. My name is Joey. I get the privilege of serving on the team here, and it's good to be here this morning with you. Wanted to give you a quick update for those of you that that saw uh, Pastor Kelly. He's doing well, and he is home, and he is getting better and better every single day. And I think I made the mistake of saying he can't wait to get back because I realized after I said that that he probably really likes it, that he's just off and gets to enjoy some time as well. But he's doing great. Thank you for supporting Kelly and Helen with your prayers. Freedom Church, you are awesome. Next week, wanted to tell you quickly, since we're moving through the summer quickly, our fall groups will be launching soon in September. So there are some of you that have been thinking about leading a group, co-leading a group. And so next Sunday during our first gathering, there is a community group training, and we'd love for you to go there to find out what it takes to lead or co-lead a group. You're want, you'll want to be there. We're excited about the fall semester jumping into community together. Today, though, we are launching a brand new series in the month of August. It's called Legends, and so I want to dive into our theme verse right away, and I hope you'll lean in and really be encouraged as we go into God's Word. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says this, Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Just quick question. How many runners in the room you love to run? Would you raise your hand? All right. The eight of you that are here, you're welcome here at Freedom Church. We don't judge you, but this is your verse, I think. Hebrews 12, run, one, run with perseverance. Your verse, not my verse. My wife's a runner. I think her idea of the perfect date is a three to five mile run together in like a hundred degree heat. I don't know how she does it, but that's what she does. If I run, and it's a very big if, I prefer to do it indoors at 72 degrees. Anyone with me? Just that's what I need if I am going to run. But I love this verse though. Run with perseverance. So here's the big idea of this legend series. We're going to be spending a few weeks learning from some of the great faith heroes of our Bible. They are the cloud of witnesses that this verse is talking about. They've each run their race and now they've handed us the baton as it's time for us to run ours. And so the idea is this, what if they could come down from the stands and run a lap with us? And if they could encourage us along our race, what's the one thing that they would want to tell us. And so we're going to do that for the next few weeks, and I think you'll find it inspiring. We're calling it Legends because they each overcame obstacles on their way to being used greatly by God. I just believe they are legends in their own right. I think you're going to enjoy this. So about a month ago, I had what I consider a major accident. I walked into my bedroom and I slipped or tripped over the carpet, not a toy or not anything in the way, just on the carpet. And I kicked my metal bed frame just right square, very hard. Thank you. That's how I felt. I heard the crack. And it was one of those things that was so hard that I just gave up. And I fell straight down onto the bed and I screamed into the pillows. I just, I went, that's it. I'm done. Take me, Lord. Like, I just felt it was over. And I screamed loud enough where my wife, who wasn't too far away in the other room, was, was just asked, as all loving wives would, hey, is everything all right in there? And me yelling, no, I'm really hurt. But the funny thing is, is she never came in. And so <laughs> I was there for about 10 minutes and I realized the reason why she never came in because there's this belief or narrative in our house that I'm kind of a wimp. And so I guess, <laughs> I guess there have been times where she has dropped everything and came in and she really didn't, didn't need to. So I'm there groaning for, for a while. And I don't know, like maybe I am a, a little wimpy and maybe some of you wives can identify with this because this has been told to me in, in my life. But when wives get sick, they still go to work and they still cook and they clean and they take care of the kids. When husbands get a cold, they're out for seven days. Don't talk to me. I'm in bed. I just have to nurse this cold. And so that's true in my house. Maybe it's not true in yours. But 
after the 10 minutes, she finally came in and she saw my, my toe, my middle toe, which was now quite big, as big as my big toe, really. And she said, wow, you really did get hurt. And I said, this is what I've been saying and groaning from, from the room. And, and, and here's what happened, though. And it, it's funny to even think about this as I replay the events in my head. The next couple of days, when I would walk into my room, I would walk into my room very slowly. I would walk in thinking, okay, let me clear the carpet this time. And then I would eye my bed frame. This is completely true. I would look at the frame, made sure we were just a, an appropriate distance apart. There was this respect thing going on, like I see you and I'm not going anywhere near you. But because of the injury, if we can call it that, I'm gonna call it that, because of that, I hobbled for a good bit, and I was very timid when I walked inside of my room. And, and here's what I've, what I've come to know as we're walking through or as we're trying to run this race in life that God has called us to, that every wound that we have received, the brokenness that we've had to endure, the disappointment, the limitations that people have placed on us, some we've placed on ourselves, they actually can cripple us from running our race with perseverance, that race that God has marked out for us. It, it can cause us to become timid and to shrink back a little bit. So I love reading this passage and I love reading it in the message version because it really does encourage and inspire. So it'll be on the screen if you wanna follow along. This is that same passage, but in the message, it says, do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blaze the way, all those faith giants who have gone ahead of us, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we'd better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. Tell your neighbor real quick, don't you quit. Just tell them that. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. And then he goes on. I just told you to say don't quit. Some of you are saying more things, I think, after. Just kidding. <laughs> he goes on and he says, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it. This is why we're gathered here Sunday morning together in this community to draw close to Jesus, to, to learn more about who he is. We're studying how he did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. Listen to this part. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, broken toes, rolled ankles, crippled by circumstances, go over that story again, line by line. Think about Jesus, what he plowed through, and that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. How many of you need a little adrenaline to your soul this morning? It's like an espresso shot just right at the right time. This is what God's word does for us. It can just infuse some, some spiritual adrenaline. But here's what I found that the difference between adrenaline in my soul, peace in my heart, serving the Lord with gladness and the opposite is often in what I choose to focus on. Where am I fixing my focus? If you ask a family of four who go visit Disney World in August, like some people do, and then come back from their trip, if you ask them about their trip, I think you could get four different answers. Dad would respond this way, it was miserable, I was hot, I'm glad that I'm home. Mom maybe would say something like this, we got a great deal and the kids had a lot of fun. Kid number one may say, I loved it, we saw so many princesses. And kid number two would say, I ate so much candy and junk food, I want to live at Disney World. So how is it that they all went to the same place, but they all had a different experience? It's what they chose to focus on and what they chose to remember. We actually stopped asking our kids how their day was and started asking them what their favorite part of the day was. Here's what we realized. When we started just asking them how their day was, we found that they would dwell on the bad things that happened during the day. I got hurt, I hurt this, sissy did this to me. When we changed the question to what was your favorite part of the day, it caused them to shift their focus a bit and dwell more on the good than the bad. It's not that we don't talk about the bad, it's just when all your focus is on the bad, it's impossible for you to see the good. And so when you and I shift our focus 
and we think back at the things that we've walked through, the toes that we've broken, and I really think through those difficult times, if it had not been for the goodness of God, if the Lord was not on my side, I would not have made it, but I did make it. Tell your neighbor real quick, you made it through. Tell them that, you made it through. And the same goes for our week one legend. We're going to talk about David this morning. And I love Psalm 27 because he lists some things that are difficult, but at the end of this list, he's able to say something so inspiring. In Psalm 27, he, he tells us his enemies were advancing all around him. Fear was trying to take over. He wasn't feeling God anymore. His mom and his dad had forsaken him. Lies were being told about him. So he lists all these things one after the other, but then he ends this little paragraph and says this, but I remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. How is David able to walk through that entire list, but then still say, I remain confident in the goodness of God? How is it possible? Because he fixed his focus and remembered what God brought him through, remembered how God came through. And he says things like this in Psalm 103, I remember his benefits. He's forgiven me of my sins. He's healed me of all of my diseases. He's redeemed my life from destruction. He's crowned me with loving kindness and tender mercies. And he satisfies my mouth with good things. I can be confident in the goodness of God because when I really stop to think about it, I've seen it too many times to doubt it. God has been too good to me that when I really dwell on that goodness, I can be confident that he will come through in this moment. Are you with me? David is among the cloud of witnesses, a legend in the faith that is cheering us on from heaven, telling us not to give up. Keep running. There's more for you. His life was marked by overcoming limitations. He faced giants head on and still worship God in every season. He was a worshiper. He was a warrior. He was a king. He wasn't perfect, but he had a heart after God. And today I want to visit that familiar giant killing story and pull out some fresh truth for us. I hope you're inspired by this. I mentioned that David had limitations that were placed on him really from a very young age and from all sides. His father, Jesse, looked at him and said, you have no king potential. How do I know this? Well, when the next king of Israel was going to be crowned and he was going to be one of the sons of Jesse, David, one of the sons of Jesse, was not even invited to the room. So all the brothers were lined up and David was not in the room. What is his dad saying? It's no way this is going to be David. He doesn't have any king potential. But this is a great story in our Bible that reminds us it's not about looking the part, that God is always looking at our heart. That God breaks into this family and reminds them that I don't always do things the way you do things. When God seeks to elevate and promote, he's not looking for the person waving their hand and saying, promote me, elevate me, God. I deserve it. He's looking at the heart because the greatest among us is the one who serves. David reminds us that waiting on God is not passive. And although he was anointed as king, he still went back to the sheep and he shepherded the sheep for many years until it was the right time. He decided, I'm going to be faithful where I'm at and God will promote me in his timing. His brothers placed limitations on him and said, you've got no warrior potential. David obeyed his dad when his dad said, I want you to go to the battlefront and the Israelites were facing the Philistine army and for 40 days things were at a standstill. The armies on either side of the valley and the Philistines would send out their giant Goliath and they would say, who's going to come fight our giant? We all don't need to fight. Just someone come fight him and whoever wins will serve you and vice versa. And for 40 days there's a standstill and so David's dad says, go check on your brothers, bring him some food. And David in an act of obedience, goes to the battlefront and he is faced with such opposition, such insult from his brothers that said things like, you don't belong here. You're just here to watch the battle. Your heart is wicked. And if I was David in this moment, I tend to be a little snarky and maybe a little passive aggressive sometimes. I could say, excuse me, what battle? Uh, you guys aren't even fighting, but I'm not David. And David didn't actually say that, but no warrior potential. King Saul looked at David 
and saw no champion potential whatsoever and said, if you're going to fight this giant, wear my armor. You don't stand a chance, but here you go. Try my armor. Snarky Joey would say, why am I wearing your armor? Don't you need it? But I guess not. So, and, and even, even Goliath, when David approached him, Goliath was insulted that they would bring out a young boy. And so he looked at David and said, you're not a worthy opponent for me at all. But step by step, each moment, David faced a little bit more rejection, but he continued to keep on throwing off the weight, throwing off the hindrances, throwing off those limitations. And you can tell a lot about the caliber of a person by the amount of opposition it takes to really discourage them. I don't know about you, but I may have been met by the first level of discouragement and said, I can't do this and retreat. But David kept on step by step and didn't crumble under the rejection. Here's what I think he knew. If God is actually writing my story, then rejection is simply redirection. It's not rejection at all. If God's writing the story, God's going to get me to where he wants me to go. So he kept on. But before we get to the giant that is named Goliath, I wanted to talk about some other giants that I believe David faced and I believe all of us face today. So if you're taking notes, write this down. And if you're not taking notes, write this down. Four giants within... Number one, the giant of injustice. The giant of injustice. This is if any of you have ever felt overlooked or not treated right. Could you just raise your hand and say, I felt overlooked before and not treated right. Let's wait for all of us to raise our hand because if one person does it, all of us do it at Freedom Church. We've all felt this at times and thought, wait a minute, this is not how it was supposed to, to go. Maybe you felt misrepresented by the very people that you were trying to help. I think Jesus faced this battle of injustice. Can you imagine Jesus on the cross being nailed to the cross by the very people that he was dying to save? Dying for the ones who were killing him. You know that you face this giant if you ever think things like this. This is what's going to bring us all together. If you've ever said something like this, it's not fair. What about me? I guess no one cares about what I'm going through right now. Or maybe something as serious as this. I just want them to hurt like they hurt me. If you've ever said something like that, it's the giant of injustice. Number two is the giant of insecurity. I think David would have worn Saul's armor if he was insecure. Because insecurity will cause you to doubt who you are in Christ. Insecurity will cause you to wear someone else's armor, act like other people instead of being yourself. It'll cause you to question your call. Does God really see me? Does God really know me? Am I really called to do something great for God? David knew he was called of God. This is a giant of yours if you're afraid of failure, if you're afraid of the future, if sometimes you play the victim. You don't know what I've had to go through, Joey. I'm not minimizing your pain, but sometimes we can get stuck in our victimhood and that's not where God wants us to stay. Number three, the giant of indecision. Indecision can be paralyzing. This was the army of Israel, 40 days every day, not knowing what to do. Is this a battle or is this not a battle? What are we supposed to do right now? What if David was crippled by this giant of indecision and he couldn't decide what to do. Am I supposed to fight? Which stones am I supposed to choose? Should I wear this armor? How many stones do I choose? Three, four, five. Should they be smooth? Should they be rough? Where do I aim? What if he got so inside of himself and was paralyzed by indecision, he would have never defeated the giant. But he's able to remain confident and say this, wait a minute, if God is directing this, if I am called to run a race that has already been marked out for me, then I can do this. There's actually a track laid out in front of me because the footsteps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. A couple of months ago at the Preakness Stakes here in Baltimore, there was a headline that was less about the winner of the race and was more about a horse named Bodhi Express. Maybe you saw this, who took our theme verse to heart and threw off everything that hindered, and that would include its jockey. Bodhi Express threw off the jockey at the very start of the race. You can go look this up. It was like, whoa, but he throws off the jockey and the jockey lands on the ground. But he does something very interesting, the horse that is. After this, I would think he would say, I'm not running this race and try to walk off the track. But he actually runs the race with the rest of the horses without a jockey. 
And not only does he run, he runs the entire race. He doesn't win, that would have been cool, but he runs the entire race and through the finish line. And I thought about this a little bit. Why did this horse run this race? Kind of doesn't make sense to me. Here's why the horse ran the race. First of all, there was a track. He knew where to go. And secondly, other horses were running the race. So this is community groups for us at Freedom Church. It really is. I, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to choose to run with others who do. We don't have this figured out, but we're going to figure it out together because there's a track laid in front of us and it's called community groups. And I know if I get on this track and I interact with people and I live life, there's something powerful with getting together, talking about life, talking about Jesus and praying for one another. It, it is something that will cause us to win in this race that we are running. Oh, I encourage you when the catalog comes out at the end of the month, jump into a group. You don't want to miss it. I think we're wrestling with indecision if we ever say something like this, if we ever use I need to pray about it as a crutch, it's our way of saying no. You know what I'm talking about, Christians? Like, I'm just going to pray about that. Okay, that's a no. Like, I know, uh, I know you enough that if you say that, that means no, but you hide behind I need to, to pray about it. Maybe you're antsy and you feel like you need to change all the time. You can never be settled with where you're at. Or maybe the complete opposite. Maybe you never change. You're so afraid of change. Here's what I know about indecision. Indecision will keep you from the divine appointments that God is setting up in your life. Actually, I think these are God moments, and, and you, can, you can actually miss the very opportunities that you've been praying for. How many of you have ever prayed, God, open a door for me, give me an opportunity, bring me an opportunity, and then a door opens and you're like, I'm not sure about this, Lord, I just don't know. Is this you? Is this not you? Is this door for me? And so we're praying for opportunities, but indecision can paralyze us. And not to mention, if you can't make a decision in your life, you will frustrate everyone around you. How many of you have a friend group that you cannot decide where to go to eat at a restaurant? It is maddening. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? What are you in the mood for today? Not really anything in particular. What are you in the mood for today? Yeah, I don't know. And then you name a place, and they're like, yeah, I had Chinese yesterday. So where do you? I don't know. Somebody just pick a restaurant so that we can go eat, right? How many of you are that person that cannot decide where to go? We just want to stare at you real quick and say, please change. Please help us. You're frustrating us way too much. The giant of indecision. And here's the last giant, number four, the giant of intimidation. Intimidation and fear. This isn't David. He decided he has to face what others chose to ignore. He runs into the battle and doesn't retreat. I think how this plays out in our lives is maybe it's a conversation that's difficult, that instead of us avoiding it, we actually head right into it. We pray about it, but, but we do the hard things. We have the hard conversations because intimidation causes isolation, causes us to retreat, and isolation is the enemy's plan. If he can get you alone, if he can get you to walk off the track by yourself, then, then he has you in a good spot. He has you where he wants you. How do you know if you face the giant of intimidation? Maybe all you ever talk about are the good old days. Maybe you insult what you fear and don't understand. Maybe you're constantly comparing yourselves with others. Or maybe you criticize other people's successes. These are big giants here. But there is good news this morning at Freedom Church. All of these giants are conquerable in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, every giant has to fall. And so back to our story. David's at a battle where no one is fighting and decides this shouldn't be. If the race we are running is marked out for us, we're at a standstill right now. We're actually moving backwards. And I love the Apostle Paul who says, I'm not running this race just to run. I'm actually running to win. So I'm not here to be on the sidelines. If this is a battle, God, help me to run straight into the battle, into victory. But the army is paralyzed by the giants of injustice, insecurity, indecision, intimidation. Even Eliab, David's older brother, says, you're just here to watch the battle. And my word for Eliab would be this. Eliab, it ain't a battle if you haven't at least swung a sword one time. This is not a battle if you're not swinging a sword. Freedom Church, 
great encouragement for you. It really is this. You can't win unless you are willing to fight. You are guaranteed to win if you don't give up. Jesus has already purchased our victory. You cannot win unless you are willing to fight, but you can lose. You can lose. So let's fight. David, not even a warrior yet, knows enough about his God to say this. It doesn't make sense that an omnipotent God is on our side, yet we are cowering with fear. Do you know who we are? We are God's army. We are the living God's people. But Goliath is a very, very big giant over there. He's not bigger than our God. And you've got to remind yourself this morning, whatever seems big, God is bigger. Whatever seems great in your life, whatever seems great in front of you, God is greater. Whatever seems over in your life, remind yourself of the great theologian Yogi Berra. And he said this, it ain't over till it's over. It ain't over till God says it's over. There is power in the name of Jesus to defeat every giant and any giant that we face. Big giants. Cancer and heart disease and divorce and depression and, and fear, despair, all of them have to bow to the name of Jesus. And so David says it like this, if no one will face Goliath, I'll do it. And that's when Saul decides to give him his armor. We'll pick it up, 1 Samuel chapter 17. David responds and says, I can't go in this armor. I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in a pouch and an and of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistines. I love the details of the Bible. David actually didn't need five stones, but the Bible tells us he chose five stones. So I like to dig a little deeper. Why did David choose five? So I have some theories. Here's one. Goliath had brothers, and we hear this. In 2 Samuel, there's a reference that there are other giants in the land, in the land, same descendants as Goliath. And so the spiritual truth I take from it is this. David is confident that he's going to defeat this giant. But when you defeat one giant, don't be naive to think there's going to be no other opposition in your life. And so David thinks, I may drop this one, but four others may come running after me and I want to be ready. That's why he chose five stones. Here's another theory I have. It's very practical. I love this one personally. What if he missed? What if he takes one stone and says, all right, he's overconfident, slings it and misses. And then he sits there saying, oh no, what do I do now? And so he takes the five just in case he misses. Let me tell you this church, you're not a failure if you fail, you're a failure if you stop trying. And so I may sling once and miss, but how about I sling a few more times? And I know I'm talking a lot about baseball today, but Babe Ruth hit a lot of home runs, but you may not have known this, but he also led the league in striking out five different seasons. And he's quoted in saying this, never let the fear of striking out get in your way. And so I love that freedom in Christ says this, I'm not always going to get this right, but God's grace abounds towards me. His mercies are new every morning. I want to encourage you to keep running, to keep grinding, to keep trying, to keep swinging for the fences, to keep slinging towards your giant, because you only lose if you give up. And so David chose five smooth stones because in a battle, the right weapons matter. Yes, God has promised us the victory, but you and I play a part in this victory. But I love the fact that everything David had to walk through had led him up to this moment. Everything that he had faced, lions, bears, limitations, oh my, had taught him what he needed. I use that joke so many times, it's not even funny, and I refuse to give it up. So everything that he's walked through led him to this moment. Because he knew that God causes all things to work for our good. And this is why you and I have to remember the good things that come out of all of our experiences. We have to remember the faithfulness and the goodness of God because we never know what we may have to reach back for and use it for the giant that we're currently facing in this season. God wastes nothing in our lives. Don't think that that tough time that you went through two years ago, five years ago, was just for that time. -uh -uh -uh. God uses everything in our life that we learn for the season that we're in. It may be to help someone else. It may, mean to, it may be to help yourself, but God will use it all. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you five weapons that I believe the five stones represent. And this is how we'll bring it home today. All of these stones, I think, were processed in David. He modeled this for us. 
because he knew that in a battle, the right weapons matter. Here's the first stone. It represents obedience. The stone of obedience. Obedience is not about saying yes to God in the big things. It's about saying yes to God, period. Yes, God, whatever you say. It's, it's having the attitude of, Lord, I'm going to obey your word, every morsel of it, not just the things that come easy to me. I'm going to obey the tough stuff too. And David talks about God's word in Psalm 19. And he says, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Paraphrasing, he says, God's word is right, giving joy to the heart. It's radiant, giving light to the eyes, helps me to see clearly. It's pure, enduring forever. It's firm and righteous. His commands are more precious than gold. They're sweeter than honey. He's talking about this is God's word. And when I keep them, there is a great reward. God will come through for me because I have disciplined myself to be faithful to his word. I have disciplined myself to be faithful and obedient to him. Small things first, yes, but then the larger things and even the things that are difficult. And on a practical side, if we can get real for a moment, because this is what we do here, I don't expect God to deliver me from debt if I'm not tithing and giving and working hard and making a plan to pay it off. Because God meets me in the middle. I, I play a part in the battles that I am fighting. Are you with me, Freedom Church? And that's not just a money thing. It's an everything thing. God, deliver me right now. God says, all right, but let's step out in faith and be obedient as well. Let's move on. You didn't like that point. Here's the next one here. <laughs> Number two, the stone of worship. Oh, I love worship. This morning was powerful, wasn't it? There was a moment where I lifted my hands up and I thought God was just taking me to heaven. I was like, that's it. I'm done. This is so beautiful. Lord, being in your presence. And here's what worship does. It's a constant reminder that God is bigger than us. And it has a profound effect. David said in Psalm 34, 1, I will bless the Lord just on Sundays and his praise shall weekly be in my mouth. No, thank you. That's not what he said. I will bless the Lord at what? All, come on, say it louder like you mean it. At all times, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. What does David know in Psalm 149? He says, let his praise be continually in my mouth and a double-edged sword in my hand. David knew that worship was a weapon, and it's a weapon that brings confusion to the enemy. Oh, he doesn't like your worship because it doesn't make sense to him. What are you doing right now? Lifting your hands and saying that God is good. God isn't good. I know what you're walking through right now. Your life is awful. You must not be living in the same world that I am in and to which you can respond to the devil. That's exactly right. I'm not a citizen of earth. I'm a citizen of heaven. And when I worship God and lift my hands to heaven, it brings a little bit of heaven to earth and it defeats the enemy. I'm not gonna be so worldly focused that I forget the weapon of worship. And I'm not just talking about singing. Some of us can't sing. Maybe you shouldn't. I mean, just, that's <laughs> why God doesn't listen to our voices, listens to our hearts. Somebody came up last service and they told me this. I thought it was funny. They, they said they heard a guy say once, when I face a problem, I sing. But then I realized my voice is far worse than my problems. So it's not just about <laughs> singing. Worship is a heart attitude before God, and it's that conscious choice that I am going to magnify God more than my problems. I'm tired of giving awe and reverence to my problems more than the awe and reverence that God deserves. It's not always easy, but worship is always right, and it's always powerful. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Number three is the stone of prayer. The stone of prayer. When prayer is in its proper place in our lives, I believe that it is nearly impossible to feel indecisive, insecure, or intimidated. And one of my constant prayers is this, God, give me a desire to pray. I've never met anyone when asked about their prayer life, do you think that your prayer life is good? That they've said, yep, it's perfect. I don't need to improve it at all. I'm good. Everyone that you ask that question says, I just, I wanna draw near. God, give me, give me a heart to pray even more. In my life, I just believe that prayer is way too necessary, 
yet far too underutilized. And prayer is powerful. James 5.13, if any one of you is in trouble, let them complain about it. No. Let them pray. Bring it to God first. Put it on your calendar if you have to. Some of you are calendar people. What would it look like if you put on your calendar, pray right now? It's an appointment I think you should keep because I believe there's no appointment more important than that one. And in a couple of weeks, we launch into our 21 days of prayer. And each morning at 7 a.m. on Facebook Live, someone's going to be on there just encouraging us with the devotion and praying together. What would happen if, as a church, we decided to take 21 days to put God first in our prayer life? Say, God, I'm going to commit these 21 days and pray and make prayer a priority. I think miracles would happen in your life. I really do. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a pastor and I'm supposed to say that. I believe it wholeheartedly. Put prayer in its proper place. Number four, the stone of humility. Complete and absolute dependence on God. The Bible, I think, would call it a broken spirit, a heart that is tender and pliable and sensitive and admits when we are wrong. Husbands, we admit when we're wrong. Wives, admit when you're wrong. I'm married. My wife's wrong sometimes. Just, I just want to leave the husbands. just want to encourage them too. But husbands, we're probably wrong more. So just admit it. But before God, let's admit when we're wrong and, and let's be humble before him. Let's be broken before him. God delights in our brokenness. And it's not because we're in pain. It's because God cannot fix what we don't see as broken. God doesn't respond to our pride. He responds to our humility. God says, I can't put you back together if you think you have it all together. He gives grace to the humble. And how many of you would say, that's me. I need grace in my life. The stone of humility. And here's the last one, number five. The stone of boldness. Can you imagine being there on that battlefield that day? Get a picture in your mind after 40 days of standstill. Not a trained warrior that comes out to meet Goliath, but a teenager who comes out with not your typical armor. For all intents and purposes, he is unarmed. He has a staff and he has a sling. And he lines up face to face with a nine foot tall giant. Imagine being there that day, not only witnessing what this picture looks like, but then hearing what this teenage boy actually says to the giant. In confidence, in boldness, knowing God is the one that's on his side. And if this is God's battle, it's already won. And he says it like this. I will strike you down, but not only that, I'm going to cut off your head. But not only that, I'm going to give not just your carcass, but the carcasses of the entire army. I'm going to feed them to the birds. And because of that, the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And all that are gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves because God has different weapons. The weapons of obedience and worship and prayer and humility and boldness for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And that's just a nice way of saying, God always wins, church. God always wins. And so Goliath starts towards David, probably very ticked off. And if it were me, I would have been retreating and running the other way. But David, the teenager, sprints out to meet him. And I guarantee you that Goliath had never seen that before. Goliath never saw anyone charging him down. And, and I, I think Goliath was startled and caught off guard a bit. So he was sprinting at first, but then he stopped and said, what's going on right here? I, our, his enemy was caught off guard. I have a question for you this morning. When was the last time the enemy was caught by surprise by you? When was the last time that you took the stone of boldness and said, you know what? Yeah, I'm wrestling with anxiety and depression, but I'm not going to let it win. I'm not going to let it defeat me. I'm going to take up these weapons. I'm going to take up these stones. So when the enemy says, wait a minute, that's not Joey. I'm normally able to throw things at him and he cowers in fear, but not this time. I'm going to stand on the promise of God's word. They are yes and amen, and they've called me to be victorious in every battle. Boldness will catch the enemy off guard. Where is that worship coming from? Where is that prayer coming from? Devil, I am just tired of being stuck. I'm tired of being crippled and hobbled around. God has called me to run this race with perseverance, and he has called me to win. 
Freedom Church, stop waiting. Stop wallowing. Let's start worshiping. Let's start praising God long before we see him come through because we remember that our God always comes through. He never leaves us. He's never forsaken us. He will cause us to triumph in every situation. David had a stone, yes, but we come to Jesus, our living stone, our cornerstone, because it's on Christ, the solid rock we stand. All other ground is sinking sand, and he's called you to win. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? The end of the story. David, with boldness, slings his stone, hits Goliath in the forehead, drops him, cuts off his head, and something interesting happens that day. After that happens, the army of Israel that didn't have a backbone for 40 days all of a sudden grew one. All of a sudden realized that maybe God actually is on our side. And the Bible says this, they got so stirred up that they actually routed the entire Philistine army. So if David came down from the stands and ran a lap with us today, he would encourage us not to hobble, not to be stuck, not to, for us to get healthy. And the reason why is this, the spiritual truth is when you get over your limitations, you will cause others to get over theirs. That's why we need you to overcome. That's why we need you serving. That's why we need you living out your purpose because there's a, there's a world out there that needs to see that God is a God who helps us overcome, that God is a God who stands with us, his people. So no more retreating. I'm gonna move forward in Jesus' name. Rise above your limitations. Take a step, whatever step that is, worship, prayer, obedience, humility, no more limitations. God's called me to win. Lift your hands with me. Lord Jesus, you've called us to win, not to retreat. God, some of us have some brokenness. We're in some pain right now. We're going through it. It's very real, but God, you've never left us. You've given us the tools that we need to fight this battle, and you haven't left us by yourself. You're fighting it with us, and you said we're already victorious. If we would just swing a weapon, you're going to cause us to win. Strengthen us, inspire us to take a step today. Whatever that step would be, we're coming after you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Why don't we sing this out together as a declaration? God's the one that's going to cause us to win. He's called us to be victorious. Come on.